scripture reading. Hmm. When did I know these? Okay. <laughs> First uh, reading will be 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 24 by Miss Nylin Noel. And the second scripture will be John 1, 6 through 8, then 19 through 28 by Sister Namewin Banks. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning, church. Good morning. I will be reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil, May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you faithful, and he will do this. Good morning, church. I'll be reading John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, as well as 19 through 28. And there's as follows. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but he confessed. I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. No, so far so good. Are we feeling joy? You yes. should have had that when you came in, but if you didn't, I hope you do now. Because we just, this is just the appetizer, right? And, and we're going to have one more song to Sermonic, and then we'll have our message from Pastor Pella. So, peace, love, and joy.
was blind, but now I see. Yeah. We went back in the door for a night, but joy comes up in the morning. We went back in the door for a night, but joy comes up in the morning.
choir is singing. Give God some praise for the choir and for our musician. We thank God for all of God's gifts, you know. Uh, I don't know why God shipped over me with that talent for singing or playing, but uh, I'm okay because I'll take what I got, but I really appreciate folks who can sing. <laughs> Y'all want to thank our worship leader. God bless you. You know, that dynamic duo who led us in the candle lighting, we appreciate them for all that, all that they do. Sister Hale for that wonderful prayer, you know. And Sister Nylin, every time I see her, it's kind of like I, it's, I, I saw her a week or two ago and it looked like she got taller since then. So <laughs> God bless y'all for coming and, and reading our scripture so well for us. You know, we normally start with a prayer, and we will again today, but it won't be uh, a prayer that um, I state. I, we, we sent out a, uh, an email from the bishop, and the bishop was sharing her uh, a Christmas uh, greeting, she called it, but, uh, or a Christmas message. And she just wrote it a couple of days ago, but it had a prayer in it. And so I don't know how many people will have read their um, email or, you know, read them, particularly since it has a little bit of length on it. So I thought we would start with that because it matches up very well with the, uh, the sermon, the message for this morning. So this is a, a Christmas message from Bishop Easterling. It's, and, and before that, there's a note. It says, Beloved, I was recently in a meeting where the following beautiful prayer was offered. May this prayer speak to your heart as it did to mine. It, it's on the screen. So in this case, you can read the prayer along um, uh, with us. Loving God, in your constant presence with us, we lift our eyes to you and ask, how does a weary world rejoice? How does a world weary in the realities of war, poverty, violence, division, and despair find a way to rejoice? In your constant presence among us, a connectional people, we turn to you, tired, anxious, doubtful, grieving, and you receive us. In your loving presence among us, a beloved community, we turn to you, longing for joy, inspiration, healing, hope, and you receive us. In your unfailing presence with us among friends, strangers, allies, or foes, help us to remember we have stories of hope. We must tell those stories. Help us to trust that seed planting actions of justice will bloom in the spring despite the hardening winter ground we must act. Help us to pray without ceasing for children, youth, and adults who live in fear and immense grief of overwhelming losses, whose eyes bears witness night and day to unimaginable violence and inhumanities. We must never forget them. Loving God in your constant presence among your people, open our eyes. Least we forget that holy night when a world long in sin and error 
pining, receive the gift of our Savior's birth. World, rejoice. The two insurance that you, as our loving and everlasting God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This prayer touched me also. And let me trade my glasses. You know, um, that could have been the entire message because all the words are in there. But we always want to take the words that are given to us by others and kind of expand them a little bit, you know, to kind of look into it a little bit to see what more we can get out of it. The author of that prayer asked an important question. How does a weary world rejoice? You know, at the beginning of the service, the joy candle was lit, and it was lit after the candle of hope and peace. And in 1 Thessalonians that was read earlier, uh, 516 has just two words, rejoice always. So how can we rejoice always? with all the challenges, with all that's going on in our life, with all that's going on in the world. We got all these wars going on and, you know, all of these issues that we have to deal with worldwide. With all of this stuff going on, how can we rejoice? There's always going to be challenges to rejoicing. But that is the question that we look to answer today, because if God tells us to rejoice always, there must be a way to do that. So let us start by remembering that words such as hope, such as peace and joy, they have a different meaning in the kingdom of God. In other words, as they are used in the Bible, those words mean something different than what they mean to us in the dictionary today. In other words, outside of the church, you know, these words have a different meaning than we should give them inside the church. And, you know, the secret is the more we grow to be like Jesus Christ, the more we are sanctified, the more we are on this journey, you know, the better we should be able to understand and to live out these words. Uh, First Thessalonians is believed to be the first New Testament book that was written. It was written only a couple of decades after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know, the people at that time, just 20 years or so in, they were already starting to, you know, uh, understand why has Jesus not returned? You know, what's holding him up? You know, uh, he said he was coming back. Okay, how come he hasn't come back? And what should we do In the meantime, how are we going to live? How do we live what we would call today the Christian Christian life? You know, that's still a question for us today. That's one of the reasons we gather together and support each other. That's one of the reasons we come to Bible studies and Sunday schools and come and, and to church service during the message and all of this kind of stuff. We're trying to get some more, get some information as to how we are supposed to live this Christian life. Well, you know, the Apostle Paul answers that question. You know, he answers that question for the Thessalonians, but Those words properly interpreted also are for us today. Paul starts with rejoice always, but right after that, in the very next verse, which only uh, has three words in it, he says, pray without ceasing. In other words, if you're going to pray without ceasing and rejoice always, um, prayer and rejoicing come together. Christians are to rejoice by praying. And if we are always praying, we're always rejoicing. In other words, rejoicing is praying. You know, you wonder why 
you know, we, you know, how can you pray without ceasing? Because you're not always doing what we often consider prayer. So there must be more to it than we have understood, you know, by the way that we might have been taught earlier on in life. You know, so this might sound confusing, but you have to keep on drilling. You have to keep on coming. After you learn a little bit, it, it, Reverend Austin, they have to keep on coming, right? They have to keep on coming to that Sunday school, to that Bible study. They have to keep on trying to understand what it is that God is trying to tell us. You know, we have joy when we pray because our God is able. No matter what's going on in this world, we pray for a God who is able, a God that can do anything, anywhere, for anybody. You know, God can satisfy all of our needs all at one time. We pray to a God because God is able, a God that never leaves us, a God who has sent Jesus to redeem us and the Holy Spirit to sustain us until Jesus returned, because you know when Jesus returned, Jesus is going to make it all right. The Thessalonians were living in hard times. You know, they were, they were still in the Roman Empire. They were still being oppressed. All of that stuff was still going on. But, you know, all of that is also true for us today. We, too, are living in very hard times. You know, we have people close to us who are sick and dying and so forth. We have people far away. You listen to the news, you almost want to shut it off and, you know, just have a good cry for all the suffering that's going on around the world. But, you know, until Christ returns, it's going to be that way. You know, there's always going to be something going on. Evil will not be removed from the world until Christ returns comes. We will live in a troubled world until then. That does not mean that we as Christians, we as believers of God, that does not mean that we can't have hope. We can't have peace and we can't have joy because yes, we can. We can have joy because we have the answer. We have God. Now, now understand that joy is different than fun. There is a difference between those two, okay? Fun is a good feeling. Y'all might remember the last time y'all had fun. Uh, hopefully it was recently, you know, but, you know, there's a big difference between fun and joy because joy is a confidence, Joy is an assurance, uh, you know, it's an assurance that we are in the family of God and that God will take care of us, not only now, but forever and into eternity. You know, that is why we can have joy when all of this stuff is going on around us. As we rejoice and pray, Paul says we are to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. For us, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for us. There's a lot in there, y'all. You know, so what that means is we have to have a heart of gratitude. We have to give thanks for what's, you know, for what God is doing for us. Like rejoicing, giving thanks is also praying. You know, when you give thanks, you are praying. I like the way the, one of the theologians I read this week, David Bartlett, uh, Bartlett said, he put it this way, constant rejoicing and regular thanksgiving are themselves perpetual prayer. So you see those three verses that Paul's laying out in this chapter of, Th of Thessalonians, they all go together. This is how we can pray without ceasing because prayer, you can speak to God in, in, in numerous ways, you know. And so if you're always doing what God would have you to do, if you are always thanking and praising and so forth, you are in prayer. But then the Apostle Paul goes further. He says, do not quench the spirit. 
Now, there's a lot more to that, but that's another sermon. But, you know, we aren't supposed to let anything stop us from rejoicing and giving thanks as you live and worship our God. We should always do that, and we should not let anything stop us from doing that, and we shouldn't be faked out by people who aren't telling the truth. Y'all know there's some people out there who are carrying the Christian label, okay? But you need to test the spirit. You need to know whether, you know, what they are saying and what they are doing and what they're claiming of God, you need to test it to see if it's really, okay? Uh, that is not a sermon. That's a parking lot discussion, okay? We, <laughs> you you got to be careful, you know, with, with, with what you say, what you say, because there's a lot going on in this world, and we have to rightly divide the word of God, we need to really understand who's speaking for God and who is not. While we are rejoicing, while we are giving thanks, while we are praying, we also have an obligation to be obedient and faithful to God. Paul and in his instructions to the Thessalonians for living this Christian life says, hold fast to what is God and sustain abstain from every form of evil. Okay, that's verse 21. What it, what, it, what it means is we're supposed to give up. You know, when we accept Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior, you're not going to be perfect. You ain't going to be doing, be doing it all right. You know, the, we're still going to fall short of the will of God, but at least we're supposed to be trying. We have to be committed to doing what Christ would have us to do. And, and if you are giving it your best effort, Jesus understands. You know, the Lord God who will judge you will understand. And Jesus has already died for all the sons, all, the, all those sins you have committed and for all those sins you will uh, commit because he's already paid the price for all sin. It is impossible to rejoice and give thanks when you're doing the wrong thing. If you ain't acting right, if you ain't doing right, and you know you're not acting right and doing right, you're just separating yourself from God. You are just taking away your own blessing. You know, you are removing and preventing yourself from joy. So just understand that you can't do both at the same time. You can't have peace and joy if you're out there doing stuff that you know you are not supposed to do. Paul writes in another one of his uh, letters to the Romans in chapter 12, he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to prevent your bodies, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God? What is good and acceptable and perfect? That is so true. We have to go through a process that when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it ain't going to be all right just the next day. That's just your start. You have to transform your mind and discipline your body to the will of God. And the more you're able to do that, the more joy you will have. We have to live the life. We have joy and give thanks that the price has been paid for salvation and for eternal life. We can have joy in hard times because we know we have salvation and we know eternal life is coming. Christ is coming again. We don't know the time. We don't know the day. We don't know nothing about it. All we have is the promise, and we know that a promise from God is something that we, you know, we can stand on, that it is coming. That So we don't have to worry about life or death, okay, because the price for death has already been paid, that death has been defeated. And so we can go on and live this life and do everything that we're supposed to do that, we, you know, we just go on living, living according to the way Paul taught the Thessalonians and therefore gave us the message of how we are to live. And if we do that, we can have hope 
we can have peace, and we can have joy. Amen? Amen. It all starts, it all starts with giving your life to Christ. You know, it doesn't start with joining a church, you know? It don't start with just thinking you good and living a good life, okay? Because you got to test the spirit. Most of us don't know what a good life looks like because it's God who tells us what that is, okay? I can't tell you what it is unless I'm speaking for God. And so you have to have a relationship with God. And that's what we offer. That's what God offers. That's what John the Baptist was talking about. That's what we should be talking about. We should be trying to lead everybody we know to Christ. I should say everybody that we have a relationship with. And that's because God wants everybody to get the message. God wants everybody to know Jesus Christ, that Jesus was sent so that sin would be paid for everybody. Not everybody will accept it, you know, uh, but it is our job to spread the word, to let people know. And the more that we're able to do that, the more joy we will have. So we, so, so, so we invite you, if you haven't already done so, to give your life to Christ. Give your life to Christ. Now, you can do that right now if you're in the building. If you haven't already done so, we don't assume just because you've been coming to the building that you've given your life to Christ. You might have been coming ever since your parents brought you, okay? Um, and you might be a very good churchgoer, but that don't mean you have a personal relationship with God. It's that relationship, you know, that puts you in the right spot. It's that relationship that guarantees you salvation. You know, it is that relationship that makes things happen. So if you haven't given your life to Christ, do it right now. And you can let us know by walking forward and, 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 and just announcing that to us, letting, sharing that with us. You know, you can do it in the privacy of wherever you're listening. You know, at any time, day or night, you can submit yourself to God. But we, we being the church, we're the church that wants to be what God would have his people down here on earth to be. We want to be the church that does the work that Christ uh, created us to do and that Christ paid the price for us to be able to do it. So if you don't have a church home, you got to get one. And we welcome you here. So the doors of our church are open, and that's another thing we ought to do. You know, churches are going through all kinds of stuff, you know, in this troubled world today. And we need to do our work in order to spread that. Start with your family. You know, you got folks in your family, especially the little ones, they ain't got no choice. You know, you can figure out how best to introduce them to God. But that's our job, okay? You got some older folks around. If you're like me and you had some folks that, you know, got some age on them, but yet they had not, you know, accepted Jesus Christ, well, that's your mission field, you know? You know, go to them. And then your friends, you know, let them know. Your enemies, just keep living the life. Maybe they'll see it, you know? Maybe somebody will introduce it to them, but that's the work that we ought to do. So we need to always have a church where people want to affiliate so that they can grow and so that they can go out and spread the gospel also. But the scripture says, pray without ceasing. The scripture says, give thanks. So it's prayer time. We open the altar the front of the church you know for folks who want to come near but assume whatever position you're comfortable with so that you can talk to God without distraction it's prayer time
holy and loving God. The God who saw the need to send the Christ child. The God who understood that we couldn't live this life alone and sent the Holy Spirit. That spirit that lives within us and reminds us of the life, death, and resurrection of our Jesus, the one who paid the price that we could have a life in spite of all that's going on around us, that because of Jesus, we can leave it all in your hands. And leaving it in your hands don't mean, God, that we expect you to do it all. Because, Lord, we know that you did all of this so that we would serve, so that we would be your army down here on earth. So, Lord, we ask you, O oh God, in this Christmas season, that, Lord, you continue, God, to let us know individually. And that, Lord, you knit us together, Lord, so that we can come into agreement as to the work, God, that you would have us to do. Lord, we know that in that way, we'll be spreading the gospel, that we'll be making this world a better place. Lord, we know that there are all kinds of things going on, but Lord, you've already given us the answer. Christ told us to spread the gospel and to make disciples. But for all of those that we do not reach, Lord, you've told us, that Satan is the prince of this earth. And so therefore, there will be evil. There will be hardship. But Lord, we know, oh God, that once we've done all that we can do, that Lord, you are there. You are there for us. And Lord, you can help us to do all that you would have us to do in our time. So Lord, we can depend upon you. So Lord, we are grateful. Lord, we know that as we close out the year, that it's been a tough year for some people. Lord, uh, we know that people have lost loved ones, and Lord, they've gone on to glory. But Lord, even in that, Lord, we can have joy because we know that after life down here, that there's life up there. So Lord, we're grateful even in our mourning. So Lord, we ask you, God, to comfort us and to help us, God, to deal with our loss. Lord, there are people who are sick, and whether it's just the aging of our bodies, Lord, or it's under attack from something in the world, God, Lord, we ask you, God, to heal, to give comfort, to help us to understand what it is that we ought to do, because, Lord, we fall short sometime in terms of reaching out and giving comfort to people. Lord, we ask you to be with our young people, our students, our children, our babies, oh God, that, Lord, we will do our part in helping them, God, to grow the way you would have them to grow, that we would teach them to live, God, the way that you would have them to live, God, that you have given us responsibility, Lord, until they get up of age, Lord, where they can be in touch with you directly. But Lord, we know that we just shouldn't waste that time, that we should start at birth, God. And Lord, we should do the, what Jesus has asked us to do. Lord, we pray for Coleman, for our church. Lord, we pray for the Peninsula of Delaware Conference and our Bishop Easterling and all the people, Lord, who have come together, Lord, to make this organization what it is. Lord, we ask you to lead us and guide us because there's trouble even in the church. So, Lord, we ask your blessings, oh God. Lord, we ask you to bless the communities that surround this church and the communities in which we live. Lord, as we come towards the end of the year, Lord, we want to, Lord, just prepare ourselves, oh God, for that great celebration of the birth of the Christ child. And know, God, that you're still on the throne, 
that you're still there and all things are possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, give God some praise because God is worthy, oh God.